You know, one of the really nice things about the podcast is I can give you more of a story when I have something to tell you rather than just two lines on a Twitter or something like that or somewhere else where you just uh, make a notice or something. And as everyone knows, they've followed the saga of uh, my horse that I own with Leon Slider, who's from Casamigos Tequila. He runs Casamigos Tequila for uh, George Clooney and Randy Gerber and the boys and uh, does a great job doing that. Uh, he ran Grey Goose before that, which is where I met him years and years ago. So we've been friends for like 25 years and we've been horse partners for a while. And you couldn't have a better horse partner because he's, you know, he's generous he cares about the horse first. He cares about the game. He cares about his partner. Uh, there's, you know, you couldn't have a better partner. Uh, so uh, I've been very, very fortunate in that way. And we're 50 uh, 50 partners on most horses. Uh, not Casa Creed because he got him before he was with me, but I um, have a piece of him. But uh, on the others, that we're 50 50 partners, as we are on High Oak. Um, I mentioned, and it's been noted through the years, that. Uh, it has always been a goal of mine to have a chance to win the Kentucky Derby, to get a horse when they're playing my old Kentucky home, have a horse that's in the post parade with a legitimate chance to win, not just some horse that just got in and is the 20th horse and has no chance, but a horse that, you know, is one of the four or five favorites. We had that horse this year in High Oak, we thought. Uh, we thought so for since we purchased them. We knew he was good right from the time he uh, broke his maiden on a uh, dead Belmont track coming from behind in a tough race. Then he ran the Saratoga Special, and he won by four easy uh, and put in a tremendous performance, as good a performance as any two-year-old had last year. We were going to run in the Champagne last year, and we decided to run in the Hopeful on the way to the Champagne. And that's where the saga of High Oak starts. And the goal of getting him to the Derby and that being one of the – there's two main goals that I've yet to been able to accomplish. One is kind of personal. It's haunted me my whole life, which I have never mentioned, which maybe I will sometime. The other is to get a horse to the Kentucky Derby, as I just noted. Not to actually win it, but to have a legitimate chance to win it as they play my old Kentucky home and have the post parade. I thought, like I said, I was going to accomplish that with this horse. Uh, I was pretty open about that. And now I have to tell you that it's not going to happen. And I've been very fortunate with a lot of goals. You know, I've, I'm not going to sit here and ring them all off for you, but you know, you know some of them. I wanted to be in the afternoon drive for 15 years. I was there 30. I wanted to get into the Hall of Fame. I've done that and gotten into three others. I've wanted to win Marconi. I won two. So, I mean, some of those has, uh, have been goals that I've been able to achieve. But the two that I have left, one, like I said, is very personal, which I haven't uh, ever talked about. And the other is to get a horse to the Derby. I thought this was the horse, and now I have to tell you that he's not going. Um, since the hopeful, everything has been anything but lucky and in, uh, for this horse. And you need to be good, and you need to be very lucky, and you need to be very good. you got to keep the horse sound, and you got to have a really fast horse that you keep sound. And really, fast horses are hard to keep sound, and you need racing luck all the time because without it, it's a very, very cruel game. And it can be at any moment a very, very cruel game. We got the worst of it in the hopeful. We got a, a weird track because we had a heavy early September thunderstorm around the third or fourth race, which really changed the track and made it tricky. And we didn't talk about the fact that he hit his ankle coming out of the gate and the vet was surprised he even finished the race and he finished fourth. We didn't talk about it. We didn't talk about him not running the rest of the year, but he didn't run the rest of the year. And we got him ready. We decided to give him some time off and get him ready for his three-year-old campaign. He was going to run in the Holy Bull down in Florida. He had been training in the winter for Belmont down in Payson Park. Belmont does a brilliant job with the horses. He came up with a temperature a couple of days before the Holy Bull, so we scratched him. We didn't run it, and we got ready for the Fountain of Youth. Now, our goal was this year to get enough points in the Fountain of Youth and then just go into the Derby on works. And then if we didn't get enough where we didn't finish first or second in the Fountain of Youth, 
that we could come back and run in one of the other races like the Wood or the Florida Derby or wherever we needed to pick up, the, or the Bluegrass or wherever we needed to pick up some points to get into the Derby. Well, we all know what happened in the Florida Derby. Um, we had a horse that had trained brilliantly up to the race. We were incredibly confident. That morning, Lee uh, and the rest of his family was already in Florida. Uh, mine was here, so uh, Ro, my wife, Lee, and my two boys uh, got on the plane and decided, and we flew down that morning. Uh, and we went in for the race. We were there. You know, we got the Gulf Stream around noon. We, they gave us a suite. We hung out and watched all the races and got ready for the race. And then, obviously, we sat there and watched and were horrified by the fact that uh, we got the worst of racing luck that you can ever get. The race... Uh, in the very tight quarters around the turn. Pablo Lopez did something he shouldn't have done, which he was suspended for the next day for two weeks. We clipped heels, and our horse did a somersault. Junior Alvarado went down. Um, Rosario went down with his horse. That horse didn't really go down, but Rosario went down. Uh, Alvarado went down. Luckily, neither jockey was barely hurt. Our horse did a complete flip, and we're lucky he didn't break his neck or break his legs or have to be put down on the track. I mean, as he, as he went down, and then you saw him running, and he was picked up by the outrider, I'm looking to see if there's a bone sticking out somewhere because I've seen this before. There's nothing more horrifying than seeing a horse, these beautiful animals, go down on the track. So he goes down. And obviously, our plan goes completely awry. Now, there's always two ways to look at this. The first way is that we're very fortunate that we still have a horse. Uh, he didn't get badly hurt. He got a cut on his ankle. That was it. It was a superficial cut. He's a very athletic, nimble horse, which is probably why he was able to escape, even with the incredible fall that he took, he was able to escape serious injury because he's kind of nimble, and he's very athletic. Um, he didn't break anything, but we had to wait. We had to wait and do the things, the due diligence, do all the blood testing, do all the scans, do all the scopes, do the ultrasounds, do everything we needed to do, and wait even a couple of weeks to see if something would manifest itself from that terrible, terrible fall that he took. What we lost was obviously precious time. He came out of it fine. But Billmont, and rightly so, said to us, hey, we have a really good horse here. We have a horse that can compete with the best of the three-year-olds in the country. And we'll be able to compete at the highest of levels as a uh, four-year-old if we wish. He's that kind of horse. He's a horse that could become a three-year-old champion or a four-year-old champion or run in the Breeders' Cup Classic or run in any of these big races. But we weren't going to make the Derby. To rush him to the wood on the 9th of uh, April was going to be asking too much. He felt that he lost too much time. He was off the track. Horses go to the track every day. They jog. Then they work. They're on a very firm schedule. The trainers are bringing them up to peak form for the race. It's all done very, very scientifically. They are trained as specifically and as expertly as any Olympic athlete is. They are brought up to these races in the most, it really is, you know, terrific of fashion if you watch how they do it. They work this day. They blow out this day. They look for any earmarks of anything. And they go to the track every day. They jog. Then they get their baths. They eat. They walk. And that's how they spend their day when they're not going to work out. And then the day is where they race. Bill felt it was pushing him to get him to the prep. Now, we didn't get any points, unfortunately, because we didn't finish the Fountain of Youth. Now, it's a very odd year for the Derby because... Baffitt is ineligible. He's not ineligible for the prep races, but he's ineligible for the Derby. And any points that he wins along the way, B 
be it the Wood Memorial, the Arkansas Derby, whatever race it may be, those points go by the board because his horses are not eligible for the Derby this year. So there is a lot of vacant points, and this year it's going to take probably half of what it normally takes to get into the Derby. So you might get into the Derby with 20 points this year, where 40 points it takes another year. Now, most races you can just enter the race and get in. There's ways that they, when they do have extra horses, they have tiebreakers based on purses won in certain kinds of races and different things based on different races. But for the Derby, Derby the, the, everyone wants to be in it, so you can't leave it wide open. Everyone would enter. So what you have is a system of points that allows you, based on the preps, the three-year-old preps, to earn your way into the Derby. We have no points because we haven't run as a three-year-old. So unfortunately, High Oak, who won the grade two Saratoga special as a two-year-old, was as impressive on the track as any two-year-old last year. I don't think there's any question. There might have been one horse that ran a better race. That was probably it. But we didn't run any route of ground. We didn't go a mile or more. We were going to start that, obviously, in the Champagne, but we decided to rest them and bring them up to this year on works and and rest. We were going to bring them in to the Holy Bull. didn't work out. We then picked the Fountain of Youth. Uh, well, everybody who saw him that day and even the jock who was on him, Giovanni Rao, felt that he was loaded, absolutely loaded for bear when he turned for home. Even though he had been wide throughout the entire race, he still had a ton of horse. From my vantage point, he had a ton of horse. He was going to run very big in the stretch. Didn't happen. We didn't get any points. We would need to finish first or second in the wood or the Florida Derby to get to the Kentucky Derby. So it's not going to happen. Our plan now is to prep and then go to the Preakness which you're saying, well, wait, you can go to the Preakness, why can't you go to the Derby? Because it's not about going to the Derby. We could be ready on May 7th, which is Derby Day. We can't be ready on April 9th to run a big race, and we need to run a big race on April 9th, and we would probably have to push him. And the expert horseman and very smart horseman that Bill Mott is doesn't want to push him because he has such high hopes for this horse. So we all are heartbroken, and I'll tell you, we are heartbroken. We've talked about the Derby, Lee and I, every day uh, since we got this horse. We made plans for this horse every day since we got him. We loved him since the day we got him. I've made, I've talked about the Derby with my family and with my wife, Rose, since forever. I can't even tell you. I made a commitment years ago that said, I've been to the Derby three times. I said, I'm not going back until I bring my own horse. So even though there's a chance we might prep on the undercard on Derby Day, so we might run on Derby Day, and then if we run well, come back two weeks later and run on the Preakness, I am not going to Kentucky. If that's the case, I will watch on TV rather than go because I said the next time I go to Churchill will be for the Derby. Otherwise, I'm not going to Churchill on Derby Day. I'll go to Churchill any other time. I'll go to Churchill for the Breeders' Cup. I'll go to Churchill any other time. I love the track. But I will not go on Derby Day unless I have a horse in the race, which I really completely felt we would this year. I, I was convinced, even when I did that thing with Dog and it came up, and Dog brought it up that day when we got the award at the Barrett's uh, uh, Symposium. I really felt we were on our way to the Derby. I have felt we, even though we got a bad break last, uh, full on the hopeful, and it threw our schedule off, and we didn't get to the Champagne, and we didn't do exactly what we had planned to do, I still felt very comfortable that he was going to emerge this year. He was emerging. He was training superbly. And then, obviously, we had the worst luck you can ever have. And now, 
believe it or not, against all these odds, this horse who is a very, we're very blessed. He's a very athletic, very talented horse. Uh, by far the best one I've ever had. And he's back training really well. He seems to be back on his game again. And if that's the case, I think you'll see him knock on the door in a lot of these big races, whether it's the Preakness, the Belmont, which I would say probably is not on our dance card, but you never know. The Haskell, which could very much be on our dance card. The Travis, which I think, unless something's wrong, will be on our dance card. And then probably leading up to the Breeders' Cup, if we are still racing well at that uh, time of year. So that's our plan. Our plan is obviously grade one races and, and uh, good things for this horse. But unfortunately, the goal has not been reached, and it's back to the drawing board already. I'm already back thinking about trying to find that horse again, and, hey, I might never find them again. I, it took me a long time to get there. And I had never had a legitimate chance to get there before. I had never had a horse where I went into the wintertime saying, I have a horse that could go to the derby. This is the first time. And I didn't think we had a horse that could go. I thought we had a horse that would go. I really believed he was every inch a derby horse. That's why I named him High Oak, which is the plaque outside my home. Uh, when we purchased our home in Manhasset, the High Oak plaque was, we have a lot of big trees, and we had a huge oak tree in the front, which was knocked down. Uh, it was split in a thunderstorm, a July thunderstorm about 15 years ago, split it, and it actually destroyed the front gate, threw things that weighed 100 pounds, the storm, across the street into my neighbor's yard. And the tree, which was 105 feet, had to be chopped up and cut it off. So High Oak is not there anymore, that it was named after, but the plaque is. And I always said, when I have the special horse, I'll name him High Oak. Well, he is that special horse. He's only had two races where things went the way they were supposed to, and he's won both of those. The other races, the hopeful, he had no chance. And then the Fountain of Youth, he wound up on the ground. So uh, it has been a tough, <laughs> tough couple of goes the last couple of times, but that's racing. Racing will break your heart. It'll break your heart nine times out of ten. Almost every phone call is bad. Almost every time you hear from someone, it's bad news rather than good news. But when it's right, it is unbelievably exciting. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like winning a big race, and there's nothing like having your horse and getting them there. And you fall in love with these animals, and you're with them in the morning, and you take them to the races. And, you know, most people can't own a team, can't own the Yankees or the Mets or the football giants. And a lot of people can't own a racehorse, and I've been fortunate enough that I can. And it's the same kind of authorship where, you know, it's your property. It's your something you are a part of, something you love that is performing and is scrutinized by the public and is, you know, viewed and extolled by the public and, you know, sometimes cheered and sometimes jeered by the public. Well, it's the same way it is for a guy who owns a team is the same way for someone who owns a uh, thoroughbred racehorse. It's an exciting thing. It really is. It's an expensive thing. It's not something I recommend because it is an incredibly expensive hobby. Um, you need good partners. I, like I said, I've been lucky enough to have one. It's the only partner that I've had. Well, that's no, not true. I had part, Bill Parcells and I were partners, uh, and we had a lot of success. Not like as much success as Lee and I have had. Lee and I have had an extraordinary amount of success. We've had three really good horses out of five horses or five or six horses, which is really remarkable. It really is. And just share how lucky or unlucky Rick Pitino, when we bought four horses that year, Rick Pitino bought two with us and didn't buy high Oak luck of the draw. But back in his past, he got AP Valentine and made a fortune racing 
Sometimes it's the roll of the dice. He could have been just as easily come in on this horse as come in on the other horse. And the horse he came in on was a nice, solid horse, and we sold him. But it was an allowance horse. But this horse turned out to be the one that could be really good. I mean, his second race, he won a grade two stake. He won a race that Secretariat won. He won a race that a lot of the great horses have won in Saratoga, the Saratoga Special. He's already won a grade two. He needs to add a grade one. Very few racehorses ever win a grade one. Grade one makes you special as a racehorse. As an example, for three-year-olds only, the only races left this year that are, other than the Breeders' Cup, that are grade one are the Triple Crown races, the Haskell, and the Pennsylvania Derby. That's it. That are just for three-year-olds. So it's not like there's a million of them. The prep races are not grade ones. We've already won a grade two. And you try to win a grade one, because if you have a grade one winner, you have a sire. You have a horse that's worth something after his career's over, which is then that's the gift that keeps giving. That's what happens as soon as you win a grade one. You know, his father was a good racehorse who's been a quiet sire, you know, not a real fancy sire. Uh, I had reasons why I liked him. I don't want to give him away because I might want to go back to that sire again for uh, because he's been good to us. Uh, and right now he's still price right. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why a certain horse turns out a certain way or why just this horse connecting with this mare turns out this special racehorse. And obviously, we think the world, the high oak, we think he's got a, a lot of talent. I hope he gets a chance to show that to everybody. He did a little bit as a two-year-old, obviously, in the uh, – Saratoga special, but no one cares about that anymore because that's a two-year-old race and it was a sprint. Now it's about racing classic distances as a three-year-old and then racing with the best in all the racing as he gets older. And that's what we'll try to do now as we go forward. First, the classic part. It won't be in the Derby, unfortunately. Uh, we hope it'll be in the Preakness. So I know a lot of you have been following along and have asked me about High Oak. I've seen, you know, I've gotten a lot of calls about him, so I wanted everyone to know that. Unfortunately, that goal that I was very vocal about and thought that I was finally was going to accomplish, it's back to the drawing board. Two goals. Two that I haven't reached. I've, like I said, I've been fortunate enough to hit a lot of them. I have two. One I have never mentioned, and maybe someday I will. We'll see. Maybe one day we'll talk about it. Uh, but I've never done well in that one, ever. And then the other has been this goal to get a horse into the post parade with a, you know, at 10 to 1, 12 to 1, with a chance to, you know, or less, with a chance to win, with a chance to get in the mix, uh, in the derby. I thought that was going to happen, and now we'll try and see if we can salvage what we can from this year win a classic race, win the Preakness, win the uh, Travers, win a big race or two this year and put High Oak back on the map, even though we would have liked to have uh, run for the Roses. So, again, it's this is using the podcast for this because to explain this on Twitter, hey, don't have enough characters to do that. So to tell you the whole story as I've just told you here. So um, that's where we are. We'll be talking a lot about the Derby. The Derby is wide open this year from what I see. I, I, there's a couple of nice horses. There's nothing out there that's been unbelievable. No one looks like a super horse, including High Oak. There looks to be a lot of good, solid horses. So... We'll see how it is, but we're getting close. We're stepping up to those preps, which are right around the corner as we get ready to hit April. This is a fun time. We've reached the end of March, and we've got a lot to do in the next couple of days. Baseball is right around the corner. The Masters is right around the corner. Derby preps and then the Derby is right around the corner. And the playoffs and football and basketball, I mean hockey and uh, and basketball, and then obviously the draft and everything else. So a very, very busy time in sports, and we'll be covering a lot of it for you uh, and doing the podcast 
on the baseball side. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, uh, glad that I'm doing it with Bobby V. I am. I think Bobby brings a lot to the table from a baseball standpoint. We'll have a lot of fun. Uh, we'll be doing one each week during this baseball season. The next one we do, we've got one that's going to be posted the next couple of days that we did. Then we'll do one that'll be the over-unders. I'll try and squeeze some over-unders out of Bobby. I'll give you my typical ones. Maybe we'll bring in a couple other folks to uh, give you theirs uh, as we get ready for this baseball season, which is now a week away. But unfortunately, the news today is that uh, the dream is not going to be realized this year. There's a lot of uh, big things we can still accomplish with High Oak. But the Derby, unfortunately... It is not going to be one of them. So, back to the drawing, uh, back to the drawing board as far as that goal is concerned. The podcast, the Mike Francis podcast, brought to you by Bet Rivers now in New York. For all your wagering needs, you go to Bet Rivers. You in Jersey and in Connecticut, it's Play Sugar House. Same national company, just a different name. Bet Rivers in New York, Play Sugar House in Jersey, and in Connecticut. So BetRivers.com, all the different podcasting outlets, Apple and everything else. Like I said, and I saw some big story somebody sent me where I said that I'm just starting to understand the podcast world. That is fact. I have not paid any attention to it. And I like to understand the mechanisms of how things work. I like to understand the system, the delivery system, the ratings, how you find out what's going on. I, I know our first podcast um, uh, has been very well received. Mons, who's back with me. I don't know if I mentioned that. I, I should have if I didn't, that uh, Mons is back handling all my production needs, back being my right hand, so I'm uh, thrilled to have him. So I was lucky enough to be able to grab him. Uh, and he's back doing everything with me. So you'll hear him when he has something to offer. The, with, and, he, and also at, on Naira, you can catch him. He has his own stuff there. So with the horses, you know, he loves the horses. So he loves his horses and his wrestling and his hockey, but he loves the horses. He really is. He's a, he, you know, he and Malusa are, are horse crazies. They really are. You know, everyone thinks I am, and I am. But he and Malusa are, are just horse crazies. They really are. And you can hear and get both their views. Uh, Mons has his own thing going with Naira. And we'll pop him up and let him uh, get his thoughts in as we get closer to the big races here on, on the podcast. So uh, that's the saga of High Oak. Hey, the way I look at it is this. Is it heartbreaking? And for me, personally, yes. But the way... I've tried to look at it as we still have a horse. That day, I could have watched, and my first fear was, I have my family here. Emily wasn't there, but the boys were. I have the kids here. I have my wife here. I don't want them to see this horse get put down on the track. They love this horse. And that's what my first fear was. Now, they put a screen out, but that's an ugly, tough thing traumatic thing to live through. And thank God we didn't have to. Thank God we didn't have to. And that's the bright side of it. So we try to take the bright side and go forward. We still have a racehorse. Hopefully we still have a really good one. Hopefully he's got a lot of big races in him. The Derby's just not going to be one of them. We'll talk to you soon.